Today is class O, 4A series, a very, very important concept in mathematical physics and engineering. And you'll most likely see this in more than one class. And that's a good thing. I remember many years ago, a generation ago, I was teaching classical mechanics and I skipped the Fourier series because I thought Dr. Bennett was doing it in optics. And then I found out he didn't do it. I didn't do it. And those students graduated without seeing it in the physics course. Uh, hopefully they saw it in the math course. Here, it's uh, good to see it more than once. This can be seen in optics. This can be seen in classical mechanics and seen in math physics and in the math class can be seen. So can't get too much of 4 a series. Very, very important. So we're gonna do that today. And I'm gonna show you a way to understand 4 a series in a way that's visual, which I learned from a Dr. Richard Berg at the University of Maryland when I was a student, graduate student, working for him. I was shocked, utterly shocked, how I could understand uh, visually what was going on. And then I'm gonna show you some nice programs, a couple that I wrote that help visualize, because today we have the visualization. But you know, I had a student, uh, Deborah Hart, who uh, took my sound class where I did the visualization, which is a general education class, uh, very little math, and then she became a physics major. And when she was taking a course in mathematics doing Fourier series, uh, she had my notes, all these pictures, which you're gonna see, and she would have a big smile on her face. Everybody else was kind of like lost, which is kind of typical when you're doing all these equations, know what's going on. And another student who became our valedictorian, was the brightest student, had the highest I mean, GPA, say, that year. She looked at my student, Debbie, and was wondering what she was looking at, was smiling. So she actually raised her hand, this is a true story, and told, the, or asked the teacher, I want what she has. Like, in other words, can I have, I want what she's got. And then uh, this professor came to my office the next day and asked for my notes uh, with all the pictures, which you're gonna see. But we also have visualization now. And that uh, with the YouTube and with the programs, a couple that I wrote, and there's others that have been written that you can see this and visualize this very easily compared to the story I told you was, that was actually about 20 years ago. More, uh, more so, like 1995 or so, uh, the story about uh, the, the physics major. And then when I was a student, well, that going back even farther and didn't have really many powerful computers in those days, unless you were at some like super you know, university, but even then it wasn't visualization. It was usually just uh, number crunching. Okay, so let's go along with 4A series, a very fascinating topic, and hope you enjoy. Class O, 4A series. O1, Fourier's Theorem. Here's Fourier. And the theorem states that one can construct any periodic wave having frequency f. A periodic wave is going to have a frequency since it repeats. So that frequency we're calling F. You can construct any wave, and we're talking here waveforms, like here's a triangle, here's a square, there's a sine wave, using 
sine waves with frequencies F, 2F, 3F, 4F, and so on. The harmonic series. So we're saying we can use ways of this form, the sine, with frequencies f, 2f, 3f, to get an arbitrary waveform. So if I had some kind of arbitrary wave that repeated over and over again, then this here would be one picture pattern or one wavelength, and it would have a frequency because remember your formula that the velocity of a wave is equal to the wavelength times the frequency. So I would get sine waves where the first one would have the wavelength matched with the lambda, and then I would have in my, at my disposal one that would be twice, you know, twice the frequency. And remember, if you double the frequency, you have the wavelength. These go inversely. So I have an analogy with cooking. Now let's pretend that you have all these ingredients and these are the harmonic series. This is a, an analogy. Then you could make any food from the ingredients. Just an analogy, like a recipe. And some of these foods are better than others, health-wise. Now we're gonna give you the formulas on how to do that today. But I wanted to point out that when I was in graduate school, I was the teaching assistant for Dr. Richard Berg in the physics of sound and music class. And he presented the Fourier theorem, the Fourier analysis, synthesis, because we can think of this as synthesizing an arbitrary wave that's periodic. He gave it by drawing pictures. And I was so surprised that I, I finally understood it because when I was a physics major doing all the equations, I got lost in the math. Of course, today we have lots of graphics, uh, videos on YouTube and I'm going to show you one program which I authored that helps, you know, with the visualization. So what we do, and I'm going to follow Dr. Berg's approach here, and we pick a square wave. And you might say, well, wow, that's, you've got to be crazy, a square wave. How are you going to get a square wave from sine waves, which are rounded? So I want to, I want to get this wave. So the theorem says that the first thing I can try is I can add or, or start. I can start, say, because I don't have anything. I can start with this. I can start with this wave. Now, if I start with that wave, it, it approximates the square wave very poorly. It has a crest and a trough, but nothing else really looks that close. And here, what we can look at is the corrections we need to make, the corrections we need to make, we need to bring this up. This needs to come down too high. This needs to go up. This needs to go down. This needs to come up. That needs to go down. Now notice that this is here, the first one I put down, the blue here, is a wiggle, one wiggle. So that would be here, the frequency F. But this other one I have with the corrections has a wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. It's got three wiggles in the time span of one. So this is 3F, which means I'm using the third harmonic in this case. I'm using the first harmonic, I'm skipping the second harmonic, and I'm gonna use the third harmonic. And then the question is, 
if we draw this here a little bit larger, right, so we can see we got this. If we add in here, say up, and here I'm gonna come down. So this, you know, I'm basically drawing the wave that goes with those arrows. So there you go, wig, go wig, wig, go wig. And then here, we would be down there and up there and down like there. So this is going to push this up, bring this down, push that up, bring this down, push that up and bring that down, which is what I want. And if I do that, I'm going to get here something that looks like this. So I'm going to redraw that. And make it a little larger so we can see it easier. This is the result. And what we can do for the introductory students when we approach it this way, we can't prove that what you need for that third one is one third the, the height compared to the first one. So if the first one went up here one unit, this one's one third. Now you can kind of eyeball it and say, well, it's gotta be somewhat smaller, but that's, that's the best you can do. But this is good because the students are getting appreciation and understanding of Fourier synthesis without taking any mathematics. This is a general class. So if you look at this one, this one here, and if I, if I were to go ahead and put in, let me go ahead and put in like the background, the square wave that I'm aiming to get, say here. That's what I'm shooting for. Now I can see that this needs to come up this needs to come down, this needs to come up, this needs to come down to get closer to that square. This needs to come down, this needs to go up, down, up, down. Now if I count these wiggles, let's count those wiggles. Wiggle, that's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, and there's five. So now we have something that's going at five times the frequency. And you can see that we're skipping the evens that the recipe is going to call for the odd harmonics. And here I have to be more gentle. I do not want to have a big amplitude because that would disturb things. So here it turns out that it's one fifth is what you need, which I'm going to show later. We're going to go ahead and, and show you that. So here you have one, two, three, four, five half waves. One, two, three, four, five. So wiggle, wiggle. It's basically like one, two and a half cycles. And then here you have then a trough, a crest, a trough, a crest, and a trough. Perfect match with the 5F. And that's going to be at one-fifth the amplitude. And notice that here when you take the sine waves, you also have phases. That means I could shift a wave to the left or the right. But since I'm starting them all off at the beginning to make this work, all the phases are gonna be zero. So if I have, say, a sine of x, then I would have a sine of 3x like this, and the sine of 5x, and then I would have the amplitude 1, 3, and 1, 5. And by adding these together, see, I'm gonna then get something that looks even closer. So if I do that, this would give me, you see, this is gonna pull that down and push that up a hump, and that's gonna give it a hump and hump, I have three humps. So I have three humps when I do this case, one, two, three. So this is the result. See, that's gonna push that up. See, when you had the first one, you had one hump. Then when we push these two up, we then pull that down, we have two humps. So you have two humps. And now by pushing up, 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 we're gonna have up, 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 three humps. And I think you can see the pattern and the students can see the pattern in the intro class, see, without knowing mathematics here, that if you go up here, down there, up, 
down, up, down, and we're gonna go up here. So we have to go up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And then we're at the midpoint. And then this one has to go down, up, down, up, down, up, and then this one has to go down. So now let's count these pairs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And see, that's what you had expected by the principle, and that's one seventh of the seventh harmonic. And then what'll happen when you do that, do lots of them, you'll get something that has a lot of these little one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just keep them the same. So you would have something like this and see the square wave is now looking, looking better. You're approximating a square wave. And as you go, add an infinite amount, you iron out these wrinkles. However, you do find there is a slight problem in that you get an overshoot. And I like to call these rabbit ears or Batman ears. When I was in grad school, they called it the Gibbs phenomenon. 1898 gives, but then they found out that Wilbraham earlier had also had also observed this. So now we should call it the like Gibbs Wilbraham or Wilbraham Gibbs phenomenon. This little overshoot here. Here's a picture from the book where the computer uh, did one for us. Here that looks nice. So then the question is, mathematically speaking, is this a perfect match? If when you uh, do all this, uh, you basically have a little rabbit ear, you know, like this, or Batman ears. You have Batman ears like that. And the answer is, it's not a point-by-point -point convergence, as mathematicians would like to have perfection. But since the area is going to be perfect, it's, a, it's an acoustic match, we would say, if you're doing sound, it's a perfect acoustic match. So not a problem, but not a point by point convergence. This is something like around 18% overshoot. Very fascinating. And then we can write the recipe for the spectrum. If we have the harmonics here, one, two, three, four, five, say six, seven, eight, like nine, this is H harmonics and the amplitude, and say that's one, you have a full cut of the first harmonic, and then none of the second, then you go up like a third, and then you go up a fifth, 0.2, then a seventh is like 0.14, and then a ninth is 0.11. So that would be the spectrum that would go with the square wave. And you could put this on an index card and give it as a recipe for someone else. However, you should also put the phases down and here the phase, all the phases are zero because you could have phases. All right, so that's the conceptual approach and we're gonna be looking at this today from the mathematical point of view with the physics, the physics majors approach. O2, orthogonal functions. Let's take a little pause to talk about orthogonal functions. These are very important quantum mechanics. Now with vectors, we're familiar with orthogonality. If a vector makes a 90 degree angle with another vector, A vector, B vector, then if A dot B is zero, they're orthogonal, they're perpendicular, a fancy word for perpendicular. They're perpendicular to each other. Now we're interested in seeing if this concept can be relevant to functions 
and it can, where you do an integral over an interval and find when the functions are different, you get zero, and where, this, where they're the same, uh, you get something. Uh, you, we will normalize it to get like one. So if these are unit vectors and you find, say, A, if it's one length, then A dot A, since the angle is zero degrees, you would get A times A times the cosine of zero, and since the A is one, 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 you get one. And then you can say the vectors are like orthonormal, or the functions are orthonormal functions. Now let's go back to our quantum mechanics problem with the wall, the two walls, and the length L. And here's the third case. This is actually related to what we just did, sine waves. And here, if we write down the third case like we did before, we would have some, uh, some amplitude here in the front we could just in general call that the third amplitude and then we had sine of k3x and then some time dependence like a cosine omega t or it needed a minus i omega t we didn't need to worry about that we're interested in the spatial part and then remember that n half waves equal l and in this case three half waves equal l which means the wavelength is 2L over 3, which you can see, by the way, that one cycle is two-thirds across. Like, you just write that down for looking at that picture. And then, if you remember what the K is, by definition, this K is 2 pi over lambda. It's the wave number. So if you look here and have... 2 pi over lambda, which is 2 thirds of L, then this would turn out to be the 3 would come up here, 3 pi, the 2's would cancel, and you would get this expression. And if you want, you could put that in there for the K. Let's do that. So that would be sine of 3 pi x over L. Now remember that the first wavelength, if you had the first wavelength here, like this, that the first wavelength would be 2L, because that's half a wave is L, that a full wave is 2L. So if you do that, you can write down for the third case, a sub three sine, and then here I would have three pi x, L is lambda one over two. And I can write this down in general, might be better. The nth case is the nth amplitude for normalization and then this three would be, become an n and this two would go upstairs so we get two n pi x over lambda one now what i'm going to do in this fourier analysis we're going to use the convention to make it purely mathematical we're gonna say that the first one is two pi. And we're gonna be looking at going from minus pi to plus pi and looking at something like, like this. So there would be an example of the sine wave, the first one. So if I do that, then two pi would cancel and I get this very nice basic mathematical formula 
n times x. And that's very nice. That's very nice and basic. So the two pi is our standard. How do you find normalization? Well, for normalization, what you do, now this is quantum mechanics, you would go from minus pi to plus pi, and you would take the wave uh, function and you put a complex conjugate on there, you know, star it, and this is the prescription in quantum mechanics. And since there are no i's, this would be equal to minus pi to plus pi a n squared, and then the sine squared of n x. And this has to be one, because this is the probability that you would find the particle somewhere, and that the particle's confined in between this, inter in this interval, then you have to get one. So we're looking at here a n squared times this integral minus pi to plus pi sine squared n x dx has to be equal to 1. Now I'm going to show you a trick that my advisor was my research advisor and a teacher. I say probably this is the best teacher I ever had. Dr. Richard Houston in Philadelphia, St. Joseph's College, now St. Joseph's University. Just amazing. And he showed me this trick once. And let me show it to you looking at n equal to one first. All right, let me just do this here where it's sine squared of x and you have dx. He said, if you look at this thing, when you, you look at your sign, say you're going like, like this, you're going like that, okay, this is minus pi, this is pi. I think when he showed it to me, he went from zero to two pi, but if you're going over one cycle, this works. Or like an integral multiple, you know, of, of cycles, this is gonna work. And he says, when you square that thing, then what's gonna happen is that you're gonna get, this thing's gonna come up and you know, change a little bit, get a little distorted, and that'll come up like this, something like that, right? And if it's one, this will still be one because you're squaring it one, but at least you'll get something like that. And he said, if you then look at, say the cosine, which does this, okay, so the cosine is gonna do, do this. Cosine starts at one, and then when you get to pi, it's negative one. So negative one, say plus one. Then when you square this thing, what'll happen is you'll get, you know, this up in here, this, but then see this one will flip over and this one here will flip over like that. And these are, these are two that could be joined together as halves. So in other words, these are gonna be the same areas. So he said this is really the same as doing one half of doing the sine squared with the cosine squared. You know, do, do both, take one half. And since this is one, minus pi to plus pi, you're gonna have here one half uh, times x from minus pi to plus pi, and that'll be one half pi minus a minus pi, you know, put, in the, put in your limits. This is two pi, and your answer is pi. And this will work for all these n's. These are n's are uh, integer. So if they're integer, they're still gonna work if you go from minus pi to plus pi on sine squared of nx dx, you can still do the one half trick, minus pi to plus pi, and do the cosine squared nx plus the sine squared nx dx, and this is gonna be one, and you're gonna get the same, the same result, it's gonna be pi. So that means if this is gonna be pi, 
that means a squared n times pi is equal to one. And the normalization constant, a n, is gonna be one over the square root of pi. So your wave function, say here, would be one over the square root of pi times sine of n x. And in quantum mechanics, this is generally the thing that's gonna happen. And then when you find uh, the different states, like when you take n is not equal to m, and you do this kind of an integral, this is where you get the idea of orthogonality. So if you had the star, say here, with the n, and over here you had an m1, uh, here we don't have any imaginary numbers, so we could take the star away. This will get you zero. I would like I would like to prove that. For this case, I would like to show you that that you would indeed get zero. In other words, I would like to show you that if you go from minus pi to plus pi of sine of nx times the sine of mx, where they're not equal, they're different, that I'm gonna show you that that's gonna be zero. And that's what we mean by then the orthogonal functions. That these functions here, these functions here are orthogonal. It forms a Hilbert space. And this is very deep stuff in quantum mechanics. But let's go ahead and do this. We need this for the Fourier uh, class today. We, we actually need, need this result. So what we're gonna do is use the powerful Euler relation, e to the i theta is cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. So e to the minus i theta is cosine of theta since the sine is an odd function, this will then have the minus sign. Because you put in minus theta, cosine minus theta is the same as cosine theta. Put in sine of minus theta, it's negative sine of theta. And then if you add these two equations together, you would get two times the cosine of theta for the right side, and you would have e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta. And this is so important to know in physics and engineering. But that's another way of writing the cosine of theta. Now for the sine of theta, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna subtract, take e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta. And when I do that, the cosines drop out. And here I'll get two i sine of theta when I'm subtracting the bottom one from the top one, then that sine will flip and then we'll get two. So therefore the sine is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta divided by two i. Very, very important. Have that mastered. Okay, now we're ready to deal with the sine of nx times the sine of mx. And I'm only interested in a case where n is not equal to m because I already showed you that when they're equal, it integrates out and you get that result that we got with that, that pi uh, result came out, of, came out of there. So this thing is e to the i nx using this formula now minus e to the minus i n x over 2i. And then the second one is e to the minus, uh, plus, e to the plus m x minus e to the minus i m x over 2i. And what I want to do is I want to integrate, since I'm interested in integrating this thing, I'm going to have like four terms when I integrate this. But notice that when I integrate from the minus pi to the plus pi, then I'm gonna have four terms of the form e to the i px dx. Let's look at that 
I'm gonna have here e to the i x with the n plus m, and then I'm gonna have n minus m in the exponent. Since n does not equal m, I can never get e to the zero, all right? In other words, here, if we just look at, say, take this one and this one, we would have e to the i, n plus m x, and take, say, this one with that one over here, say this one, this would be e to the i, n minus m x. And since n doesn't equal m, these, and these are uh, integers, or like, well, positive integers, n is one, two, three, four, five, six, that you'll never have zero. You'll always have a p not equal to zero, and that's very important. So if that's the case, then this would integrate to e i p. Well, actually, this would integrate this way anyway um, at this point. We're looking at a case where p is not equal to zero. And this here would be equal to one over i p. And then using the Euler relation, this is cosine of p x plus i sine of p x. And we're gonna go from minus pi to plus pi. Okay, but if we look at this, what is the cosine of pi. So what's the cosine of pi? This is actually p times pi, but remember p is equal to some integer. So if it's one, it'll be over here, a negative one. If it's p is two, it'll be a plus one. So this would be, say, for p being odd, then I would have p times pi is odd. That's gonna be a negative one. But see, the negative uh, pi is going this way, it's still a negative one, it's the same. And if the p is even, so it's like two, then you would, what, you would wanna have here the cosine of two pi. So that would get you a one, but then the cosine of negative two pi, just going the other way, is still one, so you get zero. And the sine of pi and negative pi and any multiple, so you have here one pi, two pi, three pi, four pi, so for all the p's, I don't really care what's gonna happen because it's gonna be zero. In other words, it's gonna be zero. This is gonna be zero minus zero. In other words, you're getting zero. So that then completes the proof. And then if we do the summary, minus pi to plus pi of the sine of nx times the sine of mx dx, that's going to be equal to, remember we showed that it's pi when they're the same, and then we'll use the Kronecker Delta, Kronecker Delta symbol like this. The same argument can be used to show that the cosine is also pi Kronecker. And what about going from minus pi to plus pi if we had, say, one of each, the cosine of nx and the sine of mx dx. Well, if you look at this case, this is an even function, and this is an odd function, and we're going over like a symmetric interval. But if you multiply these together, see so an even odd function over that symmetric interval, zero. We will need these equations when we go to our next 
phase. O3, 4EA series. Now the way we stated the 4EA theorem earlier, we said we could match any function by using the sine wave. So I'm going to write that as a sum, n equal 1 to infinity of a n, the sine of n x, but we also have mentioned you could shift, you could have phases. Now what we might do to add to this, since we can actually get this function and lift it up by adding an overall constant, we might include that there, a naught. That allows you to lift a function. But the main idea, see, is in here. Now what I would like to do is go to our formula derived earlier in our course and used a couple times, that if you take the uh, sine of a sum of angles, that's the cosine of alpha here, times the sine of beta, we use the rotation matrix to, to derive this in one line. And then here we have the sine of alpha, the cosine of beta. And you know this rotation matrix should be memorized. Here you have the cosine of theta, sine of theta. This is when you rotate the axes, not the, not the vectors. That's important, remember that too. So then when you set this up side by side, where this is an alpha and say you have another one here, that's gonna be beta like this. Then when you look at multiplying, say, these together, cosine alpha, this is a quick little review, but see, the theoretical physicists can often just write these things down from memory very, very quickly, like I'm doing here for you. And what I'm interested in is up in here. This is going to be, in this slot, is going to be the sine of alpha plus beta when I do, do the two rotations. So I really want this turned sideways with that. And see, that's cosine alpha, sine beta, plus sine alpha, cosine beta. So while this is a little bit hard to remember, this is always to be remembered. And then doing this, you can within a minute, you could, you could get this doing what I just did probably faster than looking it up. And that would be the style of a theoretical physicist to just whip this right out and get the answer. So in this case, we're going to let here the sine, the alpha, we're going to let the alpha be the nx and the beta is going to be this. So if we do that, then for the sine of nx plus the phase, we'll have the cosine of the nx times the sine of the phase plus the sine of the nx times the cosine of the phase. So what I'm going to do here is consider this a coefficient a sub n and this a coefficient b sub n and then I can replace the sine general form with cosines and sines and then have f of x is equal to some constant term plus, and then as we go from one to infinity, we have a n 
cosine nx plus bn sine of nx. And this is uh, the traditional form that you see in physics courses uh, for the Fourier series, given in this form with the even part and an odd part. And that's kind of nice because when you have an even function, then you won't have these. And if you have an odd function, then you won't have those. So then the question is, how do I find the, co the constants, the coefficients here? And the first thing to do is to integrate the function over this integral. So in other words, we're gonna have some kind of function here that's gonna repeat might be a ramp wave or a sawtooth wave, for example. This is minus pi and this is pi. So I wanna just integrate, say, the function. And if I do that, I'll be integrating from minus pi to pi of a naught dx. And then I'll come here to the sum, n is one to infinity, and I'll be integrating a n, the cosine, here, plus bn, the integral of the sine. This would be uh, minus, uh, this would be this, this would be the sine of nx over n from minus pi to pi. So if you take the derivative here, you get the cosine, pull out that n, and then the sine of any you know, integral, this is basically like two pi, three pi, four pi, five pi, uh, that's all, they're all gonna be zero. So you don't even have to go anymore. This is gonna be zero. And then if you take this thing, and that integrates to minus the cosine of nx over n, and then I, I, I guess the secret, the secret here, because since the cosine of some, say like five pi, like this, if you have the, you have the five in there, you're gonna go one, two, three, four, five. That's gonna be a negative one. But see, here's the deal. The cosine of minus five pi is the same. So that means when you subtract the limits, you're getting zero. You can get zero. So therefore, if you want to know what that coefficient is, a naught, it's simply it's very easily done because that's a naught. This is going to integrate to x. And if you go here, you're going to get a naught times 2 pi. So the a naught will be 1 over 2 pi, the integral from minus pi to pi of f of x dx. So in other words, this is equal to that. So just divide by 2 pi and, and, and do that integral with the function that you have. And we're going to do an example. You're going to see how this works. And then you'll get that. Then how do you get the a n's? Well, if you integrate from minus infinity to plus infinity and say multiply by cosine of nx like this, dx. Then when you do the integral over on the other side, you got to deal with this. You're going to integrate from minus pi to plus pi a naught times the cosine of nx. And we've already shown that something like this gives you zero. We, we, just, we just did that. And then here you would have the sum and now you gotta be careful. If you have an n that's coming in, it's better to pick a different uh, index here because these are all different. And the m's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, you, you want to pick different. It's better to just pick a different index so we don't get into any confusion. So this would be here, a m, and we're integrating here from minus pi to plus pi 
the cosine of nx is coming in from this side, and then here we're getting the cosine of mx dx. And then we'll have for the other integral, m from one to infinity, say the b sub m, you got your cosine coming in on the left, and then you have the sine of mx dx. So if you take the function and hit it with the cosine of nx, we're gonna use this up here, but what I'm gonna do is make sure that this is replaced with m as the index, since I'm already using n on the left-hand side. So we're gonna change this. This is a good practice to always do. So then what we do is the cosine of nx hits the a naught and we integrate and we get zero. The cosine of nx hits this one, so where's your am? There's a cosine of nx and a cosine of mx. And we've already shown that this is gonna be pi times delta nm. And then we have cosine of nx, we have the b, m here, we got the sine over here, and we got this cosine coming in here. We've already shown that this is zero. So therefore, if you want to have this, they're all going to be zero unless it equals n. So in other words, you're going to have the a n case is the only one that's going to survive. Because when m is not equal to n, you get zero. So when it equals n, then you got it. So you're gonna have this, and if you then divide by the pi on the left-hand side, like this, cosine of nx dx, then you will get the coefficient. This coefficient will only survive if it's n. So a sub n, these are zero. So we then take the left-hand side and divide by the pi, and we have it. In similar fashion, the bn will be one over pi, minus pi to plus pi, the function multiplied by the sine of nx dx. And then, I don't like the fact that this one here has the two and these don't have the two. So what I'm gonna do is redefine the a naught without the two, like this. And then write the function. If I divide the a naught without the two, but I need the two, when I find the a naught, then I'm gonna put down a naught over two, like this, and then have plus n equal one to infinity a n cosine of nx plus bn sine of nx. And it doesn't matter what index you use there. So this is the setup. Now we're gonna actually do one of these so that you understand how it all works. We're gonna do one. But this is the setup, the Fourier theorem, and this is how you calculate coefficients. O4, the square wave. So when you do any of these problems, this is your setup. You have the series. And in this case, I'm going to use M. And this is a personal choice, which index you want to use. I'm going to pick M here. I change around from day to day. And I want to use m here. Cosine mx plus bm sine of mx. Then a naught is one over pi. These are the formulas we have already established in the previous section. 
See, now if I write a n here, I feel that we're playing it safe. So when I have the f x and the cosine of n x, I can hit this with the cosine of nx, and then I have the delta nn come out of there. So I like that. And then here, b n is 1 over pi. The integral of fx with the sine of nx. And now we're ready to go. So we're going to do this with the square wave. So here's a one, there's a minus one, and we're gonna come over here, come on down, come over like this, come on back up, and I want one cycle here to be from minus pi to plus pi. Okay? I think I want that pi. Yeah, there. That looks better. And put a little zero there. And then you could put a two pi here. And if you want, you could add some more. When I did this for you in the book, I'm showing the periodic structure, but my focus is from minus pi to plus pi. That's where, I, that's where I'm interested in. Okay, since this function is odd, that means that this will be zero. In fact, if you don't believe it, you can integrate it, and this is just integrate the function, find the area under the graph. Here's a negative and here's a positive, it's gonna cancel. So if you didn't see the symmetry trick and actually did the integral, you, you would wind up, you would wind up with, with, with zero. Let's just go ahead and do that. Say we didn't see the trick. This is one over pi. This would be here. Now see, this is the thing. You would have to go from minus pi to zero, it's negative one. And then you would go from zero to pi, it's plus one. So if you did it the long way, this would be minus x going from minus pi to zero. This would be a plus x, zero to pi. This is gonna get you pi minus zero. And this one here, and here to be very careful with all these minus signs, let's put the minus sign out here, and then have the x minus pi to zero. And just look at this piece. This would be zero for the top and minus, and then at the bottom one would be a minus pi. So this would be a plus pi but then this minus sign will get you to minus pi, which when you add to this, you will get zero. It's probably, it's probably not a bad idea to define this function f of x that we're dealing with. This is gonna be minus one when x goes from minus pi, say to zero, and a plus one when you go from the zero to the pi on the other side, the plus pi. So in other words, we just write down the function minus one if you're on the left side, and then plus one if you're on the right side. So since that's an odd function, you can't have the cosines. So in other words, these a's are gonna be zero. We already show that this is zero. So therefore, the function reduces to a very simple, you know, sum now, just a one. M goes from one to infinity. BM, the sine of MX. And then to find the BN, what you do is you divide by pi. This is a formula here, over here, this formula divide by pi, and you go here f of x, and you copy down the sine of nx dx. And since 
this is an odd function and this is an odd function, you could do this trick where it's two over pi and go from zero to pi, just do one half and just double sine of n x dx, all right? Because, see, the sine on this side is negative, and the sine on this side is going to be positive. So, two negatives would be a positive. So you can do that trick. That's a nice trick. And then this here would integrate to minus the cosine of nx over n from zero to pi. So b sub n equals a minus two over pi, and then the cosine of nx over n from zero to pi. And this will be minus two over pi, we'll have the one over n, and then we'll have the cosine of n pi minus the cosine of zero. Now let's be careful here and do the even and odd ends separately. So let's do first the even n, say equal to some 2k, where the k is 1, 2, 3, etc. So the even here, this would be minus 2 over pi, 1 over 2k, and this would be the cosine, the n is 2k, so this is going to be, I'll just write this as 2 pi k, minus the cosine of 0. So I put in 2k for the n, and I get then 2k times pi get the same right-hand term there. And this one over n became one over two k. Now this is gonna be one. But see, if it's two pi k, where k is one, two, three, four, you're gonna get one. Because when you do your cosine, here's zero, cosine is one. And then if you go two pi, you got one again. And then if k is, two and you'll have four pi, so that's gonna get you zero. So you find here that you're only gonna have the odd ones, and didn't we get that before? Remember the one, the one third, the one pi, we got that. See, now it's coming out of mathematics, and you know from the visualization. So then, if we go here uh, to the, say, odd case, and I'm gonna write two k minus one, where k is one, two, three, then I'll have the odd numbers. 2 minus 1 is 1, 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3, 2 times 3 is 6, minus 1 is 5. So then, for the uh, odd case, 2k minus 1, I would have minus 2 over pi, 1 over, now for the n, I put 2k minus 1, and then here, for the cosine, I need to put in, for the n, the 2k minus 1. So that would be 2 pi k minus pi. Let's just make sure of that. n times pi is going to go to 2k minus 1 times pi. So that means 2k pi, or 2 pi k, minus a pi. So that is correct. And this is minus the cosine of zero, and here, this is always gonna be the one, so that's minus one. But now, when you have this situation, you're gonna have, like, when k is one, you'll have a two pi, but then you have a minus pi, so then boom, you're back to here. And then if k is two, where you go two pi twice, the minus pi, you're back to there. So that's gonna be, this is gonna get you a minus one. So a minus one and a minus one is a minus two. 
Now that minus two will work with this minus two to give you a plus four. So you're gonna have for the general term, you're gonna have minus two times minus two, four. You're gonna divide by that pi, and then you're gonna have one over 2k minus one. That's what you're getting. And all we have to do now is put in, you know, for a k, one, two, three, to get the various n's. So when k is one, two, three, your n's gonna be one, three, five, your odd numbers, because n is 2k minus one. So what I'm gonna do here is make it even simpler. I'm just gonna say this is bn, and this is four over pi, and this is one over n, and I'm just gonna write down for n odd, because I don't wanna deal with all this 2k minus one stuff. I just know they're gonna be the odd numbers, the odd cases, so therefore this is it. This is very, very simply uh, expressed. So that means the function will be, you'll have a four over pi on the outside. What are we doing now? Well, we're doing this. We're doing the B case, which is the case where you're looking at N going from one to infinity, B sub N sine of N X, because that's the term that survived. I mean, that was the term that survived. The cosine term and the constant term came out to be zero. So therefore, if you put in, say, the first odd number is going to be sine of x, n is 1. And then what you'll do is have this 1 over n, 1 over 3, the sine of 3x. And see, this is what we found out before but we couldn't prove these numbers. You do need to be in physics or mathematics to get these coefficients. 5x and then plus one over seven, sine of seven x and then like dot, 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 and so on and so on and so on. And that's the result that we got. See, that's the square wave. Very nice result. I'm going to show you the program I wrote to help do more visualizations. Actually, a couple programs I wrote, and one of which is published, to show you how to visualize this and also to apply it to sound where you can actually hear the sounds. Now, to get some engineering in here, uh, let's look at a, a square wave on an oscilloscope. And we often refer to this as just a time domain because the uh, axis here are milliseconds and here the way you would work the oscilloscope you would say well look at this this has one cycle here is two milliseconds say if you went like here and like there it's like two milliseconds when these are not lined up like that we we just count like all of them because this is 16 milliseconds and go one two three four five six seven eight and then you would divide and get the period as two milliseconds. Then, if you do the if you do the Fourier series on this, so here's where now we're doing time. So, like we were doing like sine of x, but now if we were doing like sine, let's say we were had like a, an omega t. So yeah, if you were doing, we had sine of x, a sine of three x, a sine of four x, but you can think of that. There is, you know, the, the third one is triple the frequency and the fifth one's five times the frequency. Or you can just change the variable to like T and have omega T, you know, if you'd like. When you apply it to physics, as we did this one as pure mathematics, the X's had like no dimensions. So here, let's look at the engineering thing. So that's two milliseconds. And then if you do the Fourier series, you get, you see, they, frequency here, by the way, you got to find the frequency first. Frequency is 1 over t. But when you have t in milliseconds, a cool formula, 
I uh, tell my intro students to do, because we do labs like this in the intro physics of Santa music class, then you would get here 500 hertz. And that would be equal to a half a kilohertz. So then for your Fourier series, a half a kilohertz, one full cup, then second harmonic, none, triple, one third of a cup, and then nothing, and then a fifth, one fifth of a cup, nothing, and one seventh of a cup, which is 0.14, 14 cents on the dollar, if you do one seventh of a dollar, and then one ninth, when it's not shown, would be 11 cents, like 0.11. So that's your kilohertz, and this is called the frequency domain. So you're looking at in the frequency space, like if there's time, is like a space, time space, time domain, you see the oscilloscope. If you look at the frequency domain, you see the Fourier series. And this is the recipe, see that nice? Like put it on an index card. So very nice application to engineering. Now take a break to do the, the applet that I, I published. So we do that next. Okay, we're, we're going to look at this uh, application which I developed and published. It's a 16 harmonic Fourier series web app with sound. And there'll be a link at our site for you to go check this out. Here is the program. And we have 16 harmonics and let's make a square wave. Well, you can, you can do it manually, it's one third the height, 33 cents on the dollar, and it might be easier just to come up here and punch in the 33. Can you hear the other harmonic come in? And then the fifth harmonic is going to be 0.2, 20 cents on the dollar, oops. And then 14 cents on the dollar. So you can see the formation of the waves we talked about in class. All right, here's 14. And then one ninth of a dollar is like 11 cents, one ninth of 99 cents. And here I have it so that you can hear all those the harmonics. We usually don't pick out harmonics easily unless you're a piano tuner or a musician, but you can now practice, watch, watch me take a harmonic out. You hear that come and go? Here's triangle. Boy, that's, that's amazing how the triangle can be made very, very easily. Notice the triangle has phases. I, I have this set up so it's all sine waves with phases. So you don't have to worry about cosines. But the phases take the place. Triangle. See, that's a richer sound, has more partials. Uh, these are called overtones, this is the fundamental. These are overtones, or all of them are called partials or harmonics. Okay. Nice. And you can here also change the bass frequency. Fourier synthesizer. Here's another cool application, a uh, program I developed for my general students, and, and also uh, students of physics majors now can use this. This shows the next harmonic in correcting for the, to make the square wave, and here, since the next harmonic's even, we don't use it, it doesn't show uh, anything, and then here is the next harmonic I had added, and this is what we did visually for you in the class but what this does and I made this so go to 99 or so and you can see that the wrinkles get ironed out and you can see the Wilbraham Gibbs phenomenon the Batman ears starting to show with from the point of view of rigorous mathematics it's not a point by point convergence due to that overshoot it's about you know 20 percent overshoot you can actually see that here one two three four blocks going up and this looks like uh, here, uh, this is like 0.7 out of 4. So if you divide that, work that out, you get something like 18% uh, 
overshoot. Isn't that nice? And you could you could like you know just do this. Okay. So here's a rant wave. Okay. Pulse train is cool. That's basically all the frequencies um, and the harmonics added up one one at a time. I mean, you basically had the same amplitudes for all those. Okay. You can change the frequency for all these. Nice. So you have some fun with that. The sine wave just is done. There's just one, just the sine wave. Okay.